Good morning, everyone, um, and uh, welcome to the IFST webinar. Um, today, we're going to look at the rise of plant-based foods and managing the associated risks in this very emerging market. Um, I'm Sarah Howarth. I work as an independent food safety consultant, supporting a broad spectrum of businesses from very small startup businesses to quite large retail organisations. Um, I'm also a member of the Scientific Committee and Food Safety Special Interest Group. And I'm really looking forward to learning a lot more about this area of uh, plant-based and free-from foods with a focus this morning um, from Ben on the plant-based side. Um, and then we're going to have some information from Peter Littleton, um, which is looking at the cleaning um, side of things, which is always a, ch a challenge for businesses. Um, please feel free to make any comments and you can ask questions through the Q&A button throughout the presentations. What we're going to do is run the two presentations first and then we're going to have the Q&A session at the end. We'll respond to as many questions as possible, but we often get a lot more questions than we have time for because we've only got an hour allocation slot. Um, so what we will see is the contact details for both Ben and Peter, and you'll be able to pick up with them directly afterwards for any questions answered. Our speakers today, um, we're very lucky to have Ben Doddridge, who is head of technical Tesco Central Europe. When I asked Ben, what does Central Europe mean? Because obviously we're used to using the term Europe now very much. Um, the countries that he's covering are Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary. Ben has a background both in manufacturing and in retail, which obviously gives a, a very good perspective and understanding when, when working in the retail sector. And he's covered a really broad range of product categories, uh, including chill convenience, frozen impulse bakery, dairy and beers, wines and spirits. Um, he is also was very instrumental in the launch of Tesco's Wicked Kitchen and Plant Chef Vegan Brands at Tesco and involved with the policy writing. So it's going to be really got somebody who's, who really knows that subject area and I'm, I'm very much myself looking forward to learning a lot more about this area. So what I'm going to do now is um, pass you over to Ben. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, thanks for that kind introduction. Um, I'm also delighted that my respected colleague, Peter, is able to join me on this webinar also, so thank you, Peter. Um, so look, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to this webinar, which I've termed the uh, rise, or perhaps more appropriately, the risk of plant-based foods. Uh, I'm Ben Dodridge, I'm the head of technical for Tesco Central Europe, and I'll be talking about my role in vegan products shortly. There's an awful lot going on in this new space and this exciting trend of vegan foods, which is uh, great for consumers. However, with all the excitement comes a fair degree of risk, and I am to talk to you about some of that today. So if you could move on, please, Robin. Thanks. So in terms of agenda, I'll start by introducing myself and my role in vegan, um, followed by a short and ever review of the ever expanding market in vegan products um, and what this means for food safety. And then I'll aim to cover off some of the specific risks associated with raw materials, facilities, processes and testing. And finally, have a quick look at the current labelling on the market and hand over to do for Peter to do a deep dive into hygiene before we have some questions at the end. So if we move on. Um, Firstly, I must say I'm delighted to get the chance to speak to you about plant-based products. Um, at Tesco, I head up the Central Europe um, function. However, prior to that, I was responsible for a category called prepared foods, which includes fresh and frozen plant-based offers at Tesco. So from a governance perspective, I was responsible for the sign-off of all the vegan products and risk assessments in this area. And Tesco started in plant-based in 2018 uh, when we launched the Wicked Kitchen brand, which was co-created between ourselves and our director of plant-based innovation, Derek Sarno. And this was extremely successful with our customers and led to an expansion of plant-based within Tesco, but also, as you'll see, into the wider market also. And in order to support this growth, uh, we had to implement clear and defined codes of practices to govern and control what we're listing. And to deliver this, we built detailed guidance for our suppliers covering expectations around raw material sourcing through the as you would expect is checked and approved on every single product from a plant-based perspective. Um, so if we move on to what plant-based means, I'll very quickly look at um, the two types really. They fall into two 
uh, main categories. And these are either vegetable based products or meat mimics. Um, it's fairly self explanatory, but they often have quite different customers and require different methods of manufacture. So sometimes the risks of each are quite different. Um, but there is a definite um, difference between the two types. So if I move on to the next slide with the plant based trend, um, I'll quickly cover this off. But um, there are many reasons why customers are choosing to eat vegan and plant based products. Um, from a climate change perspective, a plant based diet has been shown to reduce impact on the environment caused by mass production of animal products. In terms of resources, consumers are becoming increasingly more concerned about scarcity. And this is only really intensified recently during the COVID crisis. And now with the Russia Ukraine war, it's ever more important. Um, there's a lot of scientific discussion about the health implications of eating a high meat and high processed meat diet. Again, health is a trend likely to intensify post COVID as people seek to live healthier lives. And affordability of meat is a concern for consumers. Ironically, quite a lot of the plant based products and proteins cost more than the meat equivalents currently due mainly to the scale of production. However, consumers feel that meat is an expensive commodity and in a recession, there may be changes in their shopping habits. And some things don't change, though. As we know, alongside price, the customer's number one driver for um, their choice to buy products is always taste. And over the last few years, the technological advancements to mimic the characteristics of meat from plants has improved massively. It's now completely normal to be unclear on whether some proteins are real meat or actually it's the mimic. And the reason why plant based is here to stay is that these trends are global mega trends rather than short term consumer behaviors. And these will therefore influence uh, the consumers over a longer term. So if I have a look at the latest view on the next slide, you'll see that from some of the statistics here about vegan foods are a growing trend and participation in veganuary doubling in recent years. My favorite stat is the one about Gen Z and how future generations are following this trend where a quarter of Gen Z are not eating meat. And that has some big implications for our future. And with this backdrop, there's a massive opportunity for uh, businesses to grow volume to meet the customer demand. And many food businesses and retailers are starting to set net zero sustainability goals with us at Tesco, for example, committing to net zero by 2020, uh, 2050. And in order to achieve these goals, the product portfolio that we as retailers and, and suppliers sell and the diets of those consumers will need to change to a more plant based uh, diet. So now is absolutely the time to be part of this trend. And I'll go on now to talk about some of the risks associated with it, which are, are quite numerous, um, but not insurmountable. So if we move on. So let's get to the crux of the problem here. I think um, there are challenges associated with plant based trend for consumers who suffer with food allergies, retailers and brands like ourselves have created bespoke ranges such as free from which serve their specific needs. And for those consumers who are allergic to egg and milk specifically the arrival of plant based is a massive explosion of choice, which they've never previously had. And quite rightly, they expect these products to be free from animal protein and in their eyes are milk and egg free. Now, plant-based ranges in many cases have not been created in the same way that free-from ranges have, and the level of validation and verification may well be different. So the customer profile shopping into these plant-based ranges really changes the risk assessment required for producing these products. Hence why, from a Tesco perspective, we put in additional governance and control. But a real key, um, I guess, thought out of this webinar is thinking about the customer that's buying the product, and clearly that free-from customer buying into plant plant-based products really does change that risk profile. So if you move on to the next one, this has led to a number of um, high profile cases surrounding allergen contamination. And even this week, the case with Pret is in the news, uh, which um, is bringing this to the fore. And interestingly, the amount of recalls conducted over the last few years have been really skewed towards plant-based products. Many of these recalls um, associated with plant-based products are allergen contamination related. And for me, it shows that the growth of the trend at the pace at which we're working to meet this new demand, the level of risk has increased. So let's talk about some of those if we move on to the next slide. Um, raw materials, and this is actually um, a picture of pea protein, which is one of the main um, uh, meat mimic products, which again, many of us probably as we're looking at these new raw materials, uh, don't really know what some of these things actually are or have seen them. Um, <clears throat> So I propose to discuss some of the risks uh, and things that are useful to consider when using and developing, launching new plant-based products, particularly on raw materials. So if I talk about upstream risks, first of all, um, considering the upstream risk, this is extremely simple and something that you feel you probably manage really well already, but ineffective raw material risk assessment is one of the key drivers of problems in my experience. 
On upstream risk, I really mean interrogating the supply chain and not solely relying or on stopping at your questions at the primary supplier. I mean, understanding what non-vegan items are handled at primary, secondary, tertiary and beyond to the raw materials you buy. And in most raw material risk assessments, um, raw material suppliers will be able to indicate whether the material is suitable for vegans. And the further the supplier away is from the finished product and the customer, uh, the less likely they are to understand the intended use and may well tick suitable for vegans based on the recipe makeup without really considering the potential cross-contamination. Uh, for each raw material that you're putting uh, into a plant-based product, there should be an understanding of what non-vegan items are handled in the supply chain and what mitigations are in place to, at each step to stop that cross-contamination from occurring. Does the raw material get made on the same production equipment as non-vegan materials? If so, what does the validation look like? And have you interrogated this validation? Using your experience from previous audits and risk assessments, as well as no doubt your extensive industry knowledge to identify the risks. You may need to consider the type of raw material or factory that you're purchasing from. Is it a type of process not suitable for wet cleaning or manufacturing processes with hugely complex or large scale equipment like some bakeries, for example? And there are some categories of raw materials that due to their nature that of the production, they're increasingly risky. So if you take chocolate as an example, this raw material would always warrant further attention because there's not too many uh, dedicated milk free chocolate facilities and those that do manufacture milk chocolate alongside uh, dark will find it very hard to segregate through cleaning processes involved. And one area that's caught me out previously is not considering the transportation from raw material suppliers. Having done a lot of work on a factory side of things, one area to consider is the storage and transport of raw materials using bulk tankers, for example. And do these bulk transportation routes introduce fresh risk from inadequate cleaning or segregation? There's a lot of new supply chains. The growth of plant-based products means that we're branching out into new raw materials from new suppliers and new supply chains that we've previously not used. And these suppliers create some unknown risk as they often haven't got the long track record of supplying uh, materials at scale of production demanded. Many of the materials in the meat mimic products are quite new in their manufacturing process and manufacturing is spread across the world. And um, we understand more about these suppliers. We need to consider the food safety risks, but also the reputational risks associated with ethical practices whilst being mindful of giving customers consistent quality. The opportunity here is to partner with the right suppliers in this new space to build trust and build sustainable relationships. And finally, on adulteration, these new raw materials are high in demand and they're expensive. Couple this with the scenario of supply chains that are less established and global manufacturing footprint means we need to consider the potential for adulteration risk as well. Steps should be taken to ensure the authenticity and robustness of the supply chain. And we need to consider as the demand grows, the supply chains would be put under pressure to deliver ever increasing volumes and whether the suppliers you've chosen to partner with have the same growth ambitions that you have. So if I talk a bit about manufacturing facilities on the next slide, um, look, it's fair to say that the ideal place to manufacture products for plant-based ranges is in a totally dedicated plant-based factory. Um, there are a few businesses investing that in that very idea. Um, However, with free from similarly, we need a certain level of scale before this becomes the norm rather than the exception. And the next best alternative is to manufacture in dedicated areas on dedicated lines with non -vegan factory, within non-vegan factories. Again, this isn't often a viable solution. The sustainability of producing these ranges financially needs to be considered as consumers can't understand that a plant-based uh, alternative to meat should be more expensive. This means that for the foreseeable future, we need to be manufacturing plant-based products alongside the and on the same equipment as non-plant-based products. And due to the types of products produced in the meat mimic sector and the volume threat of plant-based products posed to meat businesses particularly, some of the first early adopters of manufacturing plant-based products are meat factories. Um, and by the very nature, the prevalence of meat within these facilities is clearly a reputational risk that needs to be managed well. If I talk a bit about culture, um, many of the plant-based products produced are ready to cook rather than ready to eat. Uh, and these are typically managed, manufactured in low risk uh, environments. The potential issue here is that ready to eat factories that operate high care or high risk standards are used to manufacturing, cleaning and changing over production on short shelf life items in response to complex multi-allergen products. These high care sites have also had to deal with years of cleaning and disinfection practices to 
minimize pathogenic bacteria like listeria and these cleaning practices are therefore cut and the culture of the cleaning is built into the um, sites automatically this is not always the case and it's not to say that lowest facilities have the wrong culture but production and hygiene teams may have not always had to deal with these challenges before and this often can bring a requirement for a new mindset with regards to cleaning standards as well as the operational practices and on cross-contamination before a detailed process risk assessment is started, it's sensible to understand uh, the cross-contamination posed by any facility you're, you're planning to manufacture plant-based products in. As I said earlier, if you have a piece of equipment like a production line that's been producing meat products like sausages for 20 years, it's extremely difficult to get this equipment clean to a DNA level and may never be possible due to the tiny dents and dints that are in aging equipment. So just because the site produces sausages and no doubt could produce a vegan sausage very efficiently using its standard equipment, it may not always be the sensible choice. And I appreciate this strays out of food safety risk and more into reputational, but both risks are managed in the same way by preventing that cross-contamination. And it may be better suited picking a high care or a high risk site, such as a sandwich site or a ready meal site, uh, for example. That said, uh, many low risk sites have worked really hard to manufacture plant based products successfully and understand how every site, you know, regardless of risk status, has managed their vegan risk is the key. So if I talk a bit about process on the next slide, once you've understood the raw material risk and consider the type of factory you're using, it's then sensible to deep dive into the factory process risk. The first step here, and again, I know this sounds simple, but sometimes it's not done well, is to do a thorough process flow review of the intended vegan products. This needs to be done regardless of whether you've manufactured vegan products before, and even if you think it follows the same process. Sometimes the process flow of these vegan items follow a very slightly different flow compared to standard products, and it's easiest to map this out in a very similar way that you would uh, lay out your HACCP flows using multidiscipline teams as you would normally do, using particularly people like engineering and hygiene, I suspect, would be very helpful alongside operations people and ingredients uh, a deep dive in every storage area is required and movement of products at site as well and all the various manufacturing equipment utensils used is, is sensible to understand people are a key vector of contamination so this should be understood at this stage and once you've fully mapped out the processes you should have a really great understanding of the risks of cross-contamination that need to be considered where do the vegan and non-vegan materials people and products interact with each other and crucially what is a shared process when considering the environment you want to manufacture it, it's good to understand the risks posed from line and equipment. You can get settle plates, for example, and other testing uh, 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 help to examine, uh, ex to give sort of demonstration of things like if you had an egg, egg spray wash or powder in one part of the factory, you can understand whether that's traveling and, and settling on your vegan line in another part of the factory. And it's really key here to understand uh, that both minor cross-contamination from debris from poor hygiene but also gross contamination from picking up the wrong raw material, for example. And many of the issues related to incidents are down to incorrect product or raw material use rather than a hygiene challenge on equipment. And these gross contamination, contamination issues have a much greater likelihood of resulting in a reach recall or something more serious due to the contamination levels you, you get. And this should be controlled by your normal processes for ensuring the right materials end up in the right product, but the inclusion of vegan products may change your risk assessment and how you run your factory. And if we talk a bit about controls, once your risks are understood, it's time to set about controlling them. Uh, this may be through site procedures that are well established, or it might be that entirely new procedures and ways of working are required to control the risk. And lots of businesses are bringing in things like new color coding to help uh, manage the risk as an example. This can be good practice when managed well, but we clearly need to be aware of having too many colors and it can get our operatives quite confused with all the colors. It is hard knowing or remembering which scoop is for what purpose sometimes. And regardless of how you plan to control the risks, uh, completing a good validation assessment is fundamental. And I'll talk a bit about hygiene shortly, as will Peter in a bit more depth. But one of the common issues we, common issues we see sometimes is that site teams, particularly those suppliers further down the supply chain, do not always truly understand the difference between a great validation exercise and verification. So I'm going to talk about cleaning validation next. Uh, when looking through risk assessments completed, often the justification for claims being made through is through testing and swabs of products and product testing. And among many of the assessments that need to be completed, testing can support demonstration of process validation. And I'll quickly talk about um, what cleaning validation looks like. 
So simply taking some swabs on the line and sending a finished product off for testing doesn't mean your process has been validated and you're good to go. Some of the key things uh, when talking about validating cleaning standards and processes for vegan products is the same as many other process validation exercises. You really need to get a factor that has the highest level of allergenic contamination potential like the most milk in it, or you could be targeting the most prevalent source of the allergen or the meat contamination in your factory more broadly. So for example, on a non-milk factory full of powdered milk, you, you a non-milk product made in a factory with full of powdered milk, you may be considering milk contamination as well, even if the direct contact equipment is milk free. Um, you'll also need to consider the physical state of the contamination. So are you trying to remove something that's easy, free flowing, flowing liquid, or is it something sticky? Or are you trying to remove powders where you can't use water? All of the variables need to be uh, considered, inclu including the what if scenarios that are enacted when uh, you need to produce to an abnormal order, or you never produce on a line until you have a breakdown or orders double overnight, or it's at Christmas, you know the drill, it happens all the time. In many cases, you can't avoid manufacturing vegan products on equipment that has been used for non-vegan products. Um, and in this case, validation should be completed to demonstrate you can remove that risk. The first samples taken and analyzed should be a positive confirmation. And this means you should be sending off a product and swab samples from a product previously run on vegan equipment. And this, this product should be the worst case scenario and one you know to be uh, con containing your target allergen or meat species in the highest amount or the most difficult to remove. And the reason for this is that some lab tests struggle to identify contamination in some scenarios, which I'll speak a bit about later. One thing I'll say at this point is you shouldn't be purposefully contaminating equipment that you will never use for non-vegan production. If it never has or never will be used for non-vegan, then it shouldn't be contaminated just to prove a point. But once you know the test that you're using can detect a fail and you know the line is dirty and contaminated, it is time for their hygiene team to do their work. And it goes without saying that this may need a depth of clean that is over and above your standard cleaning practice, or it may be that your standard cleaning practice is perfectly okay, but you need to ascertain that from your exercise. Once the cleaning is completed and it's assessed as visually clean, you take your post clean swabs and the most difficult to clean pinch points and surface areas. Once clean, a production trial of the vegan product exactly simulating the real life production is completed and samples are taken. Most importantly, the sample should be that first sample off the line or equipment to simulate that worst case scenario uh, of the contamination risk. And you may want to take further samples at middle of the uh, middle of run and end of run also to give you some further information. Um, the finished product check will not only demonstrate the clean of the equipment or production line in use, but also in theory picks up contamination from other processes or raw materials not previously considered a risk and tested or validated in your risk assessment. So it really gives you that uh, final, final um, bit of comfort. And as a simple example, I would expect to see a positive fail of product and equipment swabs before cleaning, negative results for the same equipment swab points post cleaning, and a finished product negative as the final demonstration of the validation. Um, and this example applies equally to your own processes, process, but also the processes of your raw material suppliers, and you should understand their validation to the same level of detail. As I've said before, you're no doubt already doing this, but often raw material suppliers and smaller, less technically resourced businesses may need your support to guide them through it. If I talk about repeatability, you've completed this great validation exercise and hopefully you get the results back that you want and you're expecting uh, the validation has worked. It's also key though, not to stop there. And you really need to demonstrate that repeatability of this uh, successful validation. This could be tested at other times in manufacture or using different production shifts or raw material batches as examples. And the idea here is to really cover off lots of potential variables of production. Best practice would be to complete this validation exercise in triplicate to demonstrate that repeatability. And I know this seems like quite a lot of work, um, but having this robust validation should give you the confidence in your manufacturing at all times. And once done, you can use this validation exercise to demonstrate absence of contaminants for new plant-based products using the exact same equipment and lines, assuming they don't change the worst case scenario, of course. And verification, as I said earlier, just taking some swabs, which are clear, doesn't demonstrate the validation of equipment or processes. However, verification swabs are always useful on the ongoing manufacture of plant-based products. And some of these swabs these days can give you instant results that don't require the swabs to be sent to the laboratory so they can be used without causing delay. 
Um, the verif verification swabs are purely there to support the validation exercise that you've already completed. And a negative verification swab on the key swab points identified in the validation exercise is a good way to release a line to production post hygiene. This is clearly just a swab though. So just because you've got a negative swab result doesn't guarantee anything. You still need to make sure the line is clean and, and you're completed in line with your signed off validation exercise and have lots of other checks and audits in place such as visual inspection as an example. I'm just going to move on to the next slide to talk about testing briefly. Um, testing is a great way to demonstrate vegan readiness of a process, or one great way, I would say, but it is just a small sample taken from a much bigger process or material that can only tell you so much. And I'll start this piece of testing by saying this is a really complex subject and I'm not an expert in it by any means. Um, my main advice here would be to use your laboratory partner who is conducting the testing to help you decide on the right approach. But if we think about the right test, all good labs should be able to advise you and help you select the right test for the process you're looking to validate. And it is crucial to select the right one. The main priority here is to make sure you're going to use a, um, going to use a test which is going to work for the type of product or process you're testing. The laboratory should have done their own validation of the test method to demonstrate it can recover allergenic or non-vegan material from a matrix or a product the same as yours. In short, they should be able to prove they can find contamination in your product if it's there. The best example of how this um, has gone sort of wrong in recent history is the challenges the industry faced a few years ago on egg, where some of the tests at the time for detecting egg were only able to detect raw egg. If it was cooked or pasteurized, the test no longer worked. And many businesses were sending off products for test egg testing and happily getting clear results, which wasn't really telling them anything. Uh, cross-reactivity is a problem as well. All good labs should be able to tell you about um, the test and whether it's susceptible to cross-reactivity. You may need to consider that the test may cross-react with something in your process or even tiny, further, tiny sort of amounts further down the chain. And this can give rise to false positive results and create a lot of confusion and unnecessary investigation work. One example of a better known cross-reactivity problem is the test for crustacean, which can cross-react with insect protein. And this can trigger if you're using some produce items where insect protein will naturally be present in very low levels. And finally, sensitivity, you need to consider uh, the sensitivity of a test, and this can vary quite a lot. There are tests becoming more and more sensitive and lower and lower limits of detection. You need to consider the tolerance and the standard deviation of these tests because that can vary quite a bit also. And whilst considering the tolerances, it's generally sensible to go for a test with a low limit of detection, as these will be more likely to pick up trace contaminations. Each test method, though, will be different, and there's no point doing lots of swabs with a test that would need a large contamination to trigger it, and if you will only give you a false sense of security. And remember, for allergic consumers, the level of allergen present, which can cause an allergic reaction in a product, may be well below the limit of detection for the test you're using. Now, testing is never a guarantee, but challenging yourself with a sensitive and accurate method is a useful tool in reviewing your process. And testing is getting so accurate now that we're seeing swabs that can detect parts per billion and level of protein, which is amazing, but also a bit scary. Um, there is probably a whole separate webinar that could be run on to discuss the implications of this ever improving science and what that will mean for the industry. I'll finish my last slide with labeling, um, which is a quick review of what's on the market. Again, you'll see some variation in on the market here and on information shared with the, the customer. I'm not here to say what's right or what's wrong. Each business will have no doubt done their own risk assessments and validated their approach. But as you see, you'll see products with alibi labels and products without alibi labels. Um, from a Tesco perspective, we carry out a full end-to-end plant-based product review that for every plant-based product we launch. And if this detail review finds zero evidence of potential cross-contamination with egg or milk in the entire supply chain, then you'll see these products with no alibi labeling. However, for those products that do come in contact with shared equipment or shared factories and are difficult to clean processes, you will see an alibi statement to give more information to the customer. There's a very similar approach in M&S as an example, who use the same sort of language to describe the status of, of the product. I think the key here is to make sure that if you have any potential risk, you make it clear to customers so they can make an informed choice. And I know from a reputational perspective, it can be a bit difficult to say to vegan customers that the product is vegan, but it may contain milk. But it's also about, ultimately about making the right choice from a food safety perspective. So I'm going to finish with my summary. Um, of some of the things I've covered. Um, that's it from me on vegan products and, and product manufacturer. I'll leave you with a few thoughts, really. Um, the vegan trend is growing and not something that I believe is going to stop. 
it's a great commercial opportunity for the industry and the market is in growth, which can't be said for all food industry sectors. It's also fundamental to business meeting their sustainability goals, and we need to change the portfolio of products to meet our plant-based diets uh, and change to plant-based diets if we're going to achieve a net zero carbon emissions position and serve the planet better. Uh, we need to consider the customer who's buying into these products for our allergic consumers. It looks like we've made available a massive choice of products that are suitable for them. But as we know, plant-based products may not always be made in the same way as free-from products. Um, this technically, technicality is very difficult to explain to customers. So in my view, we must treat these products as if allergic consumers are going to want to purchase them. And we have evidence to show that they do. And having talked about the risks above, I do need to be clear, though, that managed well, this is a great opportunity to delight our customers and bring forward innovation and be more inclusive in our ranges and, and what we offer. We've also got many of the controls in place from raw material assist, uh, risk assessment through to great cleaning validation. Many of these already exist and it's just building on some of the some of the existing practices. Completing that detailed and full review means that we don't make these products in dedicated facilities, which in many cases would make them unviable. Plant-based products have a strong future, and I think if we do a great job in making sure we manufacture them properly, then we can safeguard allergic consumers and we'll be successful in making plant-based products more mainstream in the future. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that and look forward to some questions later. But for the meantime, I'll hand over to Peter to do a deep dive into hygiene. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, and thank you, uh, Sarah, for, for the introduction, and IFST for uh, organising this, this webinar. Um, Pull up my slides straight away, and we'll we'll get straight into it so that we uh, we we keep moving on. Um, yeah, it's, uh, as Sarah said at the start, um, I'm Pete Littleton, um, UK technical director for for Chris Dane's Food and Hygiene. Uh, we're a, a European family-owned uh, hygiene support company providing chemicals, uh, detergents, disinfectants that get used for many of these uh, cleaning processes. Um, a bit scared when I hear people say we're going to deep dive into hygiene in 15 minutes. Um, it's it's going to take a little bit more than that. So it will be we'll, we'll go as deep as we can in the time that we have available. Um, as Sarah mentioned right at the start, our uh, mine and Ben's contact details are on the on the uh, the front. If you wish to um, to make contact with either of us afterwards to ask a question that either occurred to you um, later on this afternoon or um, you'd rather not put in the chat, then uh, then please feel free to, to do so. Uh, we both promise that no salesman will call. Um, so in the, in the time we've got available, we're gonna look at the cleaning side of um, uh, this subject um, with a bit of an allergen slant, as you may have already ga gathered from, from Ben's um, slides and, and presentation and, and conversation there. There's a lot that can be um, drawn between the two two areas. So how do we mitigate those myths and then risks, myths, risks, and then how do we validate and verify that, that clean? So as Ben said, um, the risks of failure to adequately plan for and, and manage the risk to the allergenic consumer are very real. Um, as many of you may know, I do a lot of work as well with uh, the anaphylaxis campaign and certainly calls to the helpline have increased from um, allergenic consumers worried about the, the presence of the may contain, um, presuming um, in many cases that uh, a vegan product, for example, will not contain or cannot ever contain uh, milk and egg in, in particular. And I've actually got some well, indirect personal experience of this uh, where my, my ex-wife is, is egg allergic and actually presumed that a, a vegan product would be safe for her and, and, and a reaction was, was subsequently triggered. So that presumption is being made by the consumer and there is an educative piece um, which many of the retailers are engaged in to ensure that uh, the consumers are actually uh, made aware that just because it says vegan, actually read it because the work that is done by, by Ben with Tesco's and by the other retailers as well to ensure that the labeling is actually correct and actually does reference a risk, should there be a risk there, has to be taken into account. Really, we've been managing allergen 
uh, switchovers on lines for many, many years. I mean, back when I started in the, the food industry back in the, the late 80s, um, as you can tell from the experience highlights, you know, all we had to really worry about was, was nuts. You know, we had a nut cage in the in the factory and, and that was it. Um, post sort of 2000, 2004, um, the list of, uh, of allergens grew um, initially the 14, then the 16, and then we've we've got more uh, switchovers and more transitional changes on shared equipment. So whilst this area from a cleaning perspective may seem new and very scary, it's actually something we've been we've been dealing with in one uh, way, shape or form for a, for a number of years. Um, and really treating that plant based uh, products so between plant based products or from plant based to non plant based or vice versa, in the way we switch from allergens to um, non allergens or different allergen profiles is is completely appropriate. And hopefully many of you on the call will already have an allergen management HACCP and system in place for making sure that you manage that transition between either allergenic profiles or from allergens to non-allergen containing products. If you've already got it, use it. Don't reinvent the wheel. You know, and one of those major interventions, unsurprisingly from the fact that I'm talking on this, is, is that cleaning of equipment. And Ben actually covered it extremely well during his, uh, his slides there. Um, so I'll, I'll attempt to build on, on some of that, uh, that information. Um, but think of it in very basic terms. Cleaning is defined or can be defined as removal of contaminants. Doesn't matter what the contaminant is. Doesn't matter whether it's a bit of physical debris, whether it's a bit of egg, whether it's a bit of meat protein, or whether it's a, a, a series of cultures of listeria or other pathogens. You know, we look at cleaning and disinfection as removal of those contaminants. And it's useful to bear that mindset in, uh, sort of in mind. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and the aim of that clean must be to remove all those contaminants from the surface to avoid cross contact. I far prefer to see from a very simplistic point of view, a clean, not a clean that deals with X contaminant or Y contaminant, but a clean that is capable of rendering that surface in a suitable condition for all contaminant removal. That can be difficult and challenging um, with the unique design, um, certainly Ben mentioned on older equipment, uh, you can often get the where well, you get nooks and crannies and different uh, materials of construction. If it's all nice and shiny stainless steel 316 grade and we're able to clean it perfectly, fantastic. Unfortunately, many of us don't have the luxury of, of those um, facilities in our factories and we, we have the equipment we have. So maybe going forwards, um, groups like eHedge um, will we'll, uh, get their guidelines implemented for equipment to be easily to, to maintain, um, but also easy to clean and disinfect, um, which will help us to shed those contaminants. So consideration needs to be given on these changeover cleans, as well as the uh, more in-depth hygiene cleans on the method you're using, on the resources you have available, on what detergent you're using, and critically time. You know, the clean has to be carried out effectively. I'm using the right resources, the right methodology, and with time available. A, a quick rinse isn't enough. I recall um, back to the, the, the good old Horsegate days, um, standing with a, with a production director and a, a good director in a, in a sausage factory. Um, and we were talking about cleaning the, 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 uh, the bowl chopper they had, the one that was shared. And we got out a very detailed clean and got it to a standard that we were all happy with. And it was a we can't do that every time. And it was a, sorry, but, you know, to guarantee you're going to have to. You know, the time has to be available. Dedicated equipment, dedicated facilities, fantastic idea. Um, it'd be great to see that. As Ben has already intimated, in reality, we don't often have that luxury. So it's making sure that that equipment is suitably cleaned for each use every time. And that equipment can be complex. You know, it can be uh, simple as, as, a, as a tray. Um, and I say simple as a tray, the tray itself is simple. Putting it through the tray wash can sometimes be more complex in terms of temperature, flow, block nozzles, misdirected nozzles, level of soiling going in. Could be vessels, could be a simple hand 
a cloth or, or a green pad and a bucket, it could be a sweep up, it could be an application of detergent using a, a gel or a foam. In any event, we're looking at the same stages of clean. We need some form of pre-rinse to get rid of most of that debris. We then need to apply detergent and agitate that detergent to make sure we break down the debris and surface bonding. We then need to rinse that away and then we need to apply a disinfectant. And depending on the disinfectant used, you may or may not need to rinse, um, depending on whether you know, if you're producing a, a, a organic product, for example, or if you've used a, 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 a disinfectant with NMRL, such as a, a quaternary ammonium. In any case, for a clean to be effective, and we're looking at removal of these contaminants, we need each of these stages. You know, we need that time. We need the chemistry to be able to, to emulsify the, the, the fats and oils, um, or saponify the fats and oils, or hydrolyze the proteins. We need to be able to break that surface and debris um, connection layer um, that will then enable us to effectively remove all of the contaminants. We need that temperature. You know, many of us struggle in, in factories with, with hot water um, or with warm water, um, but we need to make sure that's readily available to help with the, with the process. And we need some mechanical energy. You know, we actually we can't just fire a detergent at a surface, clear off a tea break, come back, rinse it off and expect it to have been done properly. We need that mechanical agitation uh, in order to make sure that that surface and contaminant bond has been thoroughly and completely broken. We need the methodology. Uh, we need to make sure it's appropriate. We need to make sure that the testing is, is then done to validate and to verify that that uh, clean has been done. And, and Ben did a fantastic job talking about validation and verification earlier. And we've got a range of tests available um, for validation. Effectively, I think of validation as giving you a number, giving you something you can hang your coat on. Um, whereas val verification will give you a, yeah, it's going to be okay. You know, Validation techniques generally are far more sensitive than verification techniques. You know, PCR, for example, will pick up allergens or other proteins in a, in a part per billion level, whereas a lateral flow device or a flow through test will pick up parts per million. And I still get questions. I even had one earlier this week um, where somebody was getting very concerned about the, the, the level of, of number that was coming being returned on their test certificate. And I pointed out that the actual uh, figures were parts per billion reference, not parts per million. Doesn't help because there's still a number there. However, you need to be very careful with your selection of tests and also with the conditions that, that test is used in. Uh, ben mentioned there about some of the, the, the tests uh, are fantastic at picking up uncooked proteins, but struggle to pick up cooked proteins. And that's really what we're looking for with most of these uh, rapid tests when we talk about um, either allergens or species detection. You know, we're looking for a protein. We're looking at a uh, antibody antigen reaction to give us a, 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 a sort of a, a positive um, or hopefully negative, not detected reaction that we can then refer to and rely upon. Um, and I commented to somebody a few weeks ago that it's strange that three years ago we were having to describe to everybody how to use lateral flow tests. Unfortunately, we've all become way too familiar with them over, uh, over recent years. So with validation, we have things like PCR, so DNA testing. Again, something that was a, a very positive output um, from the, the horse meat contamination um, many years ago. Um, but bear in mind that um, the PCR tests were, uh, A, very sensitive, and B, aren't very good at determining between different bits of the species. Can't tell you between chicken and egg. Of course, in this scenario, that's not something we're overly worried about because we're talking about a vegan product that shouldn't contain, be containing either. You know, ELISA testing, so enzyme linked in reabsorbent assay, so we can actually look for the, for the protein presence. And many people strangely forget that microbiology, you know, straight taking a swab, sending it off to a lab and looking for the cultures that come back, is a validation technique. You know, we've been validating our cleaning processes for many, many decades using micro. So utilize it. 
With verification, we have a range of, of, of tests. Good old ATP has, has jumped around very quickly um, and has been around for, for many, many years and is very good at giving you an indication that the surface has been cleaned. Uh, we have lateral or flow through tests, which are available for, for allergens and for species. And we have things like a, a test called Fresh Check, um, which is very good at picking up micro and organic contamination, as you can see from the, uh, the short video that hopefully is running, where the, the raw meat's been lifted off the surface. Um, so that's a very quick visual colorimetric assessment for the presence of, um, of organic material. So there are, is a range of validation and verification tests out there. Um, and there is no such thing, in my opinion, as a bad test. There is a badly applied or badly used test, for example, with the lateral flows and flow throughs. Remember, they're a biological reaction. So if you're trying to use them in a chilled food environment, the reaction will be hampered by the chilling. You need to actually take the swab in the factory, but do the test. In a, in, a, in a warmer environment. And that really is about the time we've got to dive into, um, into cleaning. As I say, if there are any uh, question, more detailed questions or more specific questions, I'm happy to, to take, those, take those on later. But similar to Ben, in terms of final thoughts, if you are switching from plant-based to non-plant-based, then consider that, cha that changeover from an allergen standpoint. You know, it, it, there's a lot of parallels. Uh, we're talking about similar levels of um, control and contamination that can cause an issue. Um, so make sure you look, think of it from that standpoint. And keep in mind that allergic consumers, unfortunately, until they get their heads around this, are considering vegan as free from, completely absent from um, the potential for any allergen contact. And that may not necessarily be the case. And the key thing, as always with hygiene and with cleaning and disinfection, it requires thought, planning and resource allocation. And I appreciate that's getting more and more challenging with the challenge of, of obtaining people and also many plants looking at how they can reduce both water and energy consumption um, and increase the time you know, to reduce the cleaning time to increase production time. Um, but if you're causing yourself a contamination issue, I'd argue that uh, the cleaning is, is, is far, far more important. And those really was, uh, was as deep a dive into, uh, into cleaning and disinfection on this subject as, as, as we can get. So I will stop the share now, hand back over to Sarah. And that gives us, by my watch, about 10 minutes for, for questions. So hopefully there's a, a good few questions come through. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ben and uh, Peter. I mean, that it's, it's really interesting subject area because it's very easy to jump to conclusions. We think about meat being a sort of high risk category, don't we? Particularly food technologists, food scientists. Um, you know, I mean, it's interesting how obviously it can be easily overlooked, the complexity and the potential risks, I think, in this plant based area. And certainly you, you've given us a very comprehensive um, sort of touch to dig into. It's obviously a big subject area, um, novel foods, touching on things that perhaps pe people haven't handled before. You know, how do you handle the segregation, the cleaning and the new supply chains and things It is a very complex area. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're now going to move on to the Q&A um, section. I've seen a few sort of questions that have come up through the stream that are actually quite well related. Um, so I'm going to try and sort of link a few of those up together. So one of the, um, the couple of questions that are linked with, and it's a, a thought I have myself actually, is how can you have a vegan product that says it may contain you know, milk or egg, because if I'm a vegan, I don't expect to find that in there. Um, I guess, I mean, if I want to make the questions really multi-complex for you both, um, you know, what, what's the legal status? I understand we don't have a legal um, definition of vegan. Uh, we have an ISO standard that came out last year. So perhaps in that mix between the two of you, you could, it might be helpful to look at, you know, what, what, what do consumers understand from vegan and what what definitions do we have where could businesses go to actually look for a definition and a starting point and you know where is the industry the second part of that um potentially looking to go in terms of allowing it but making it clear that you've got that alibi labeling or 
ideally you don't have that in perhaps we'll kind of you decide between you and jump across because there's a, that's a big question in itself i think maybe shall i have a start on that peter and then you oh, can please give your view <laughs> um yeah no I, look, I think it's a really fair question like um saying to a customer that here's a vegan product but it may contain milk mm. and it may contain egg is a very confusing thing to um try and get across i think my, my view on it is this you're absolutely right there is no legal um requirement for alibi labeling um but you know when you look at what is um said on alibi labeling i'm not a legal expert by any stretch but they talk about making sure you've done that for a risk assessment and i think um from our side when we look at that for risk assessment if the for risk assessment says that there is a potential of cross-contamination between milk or egg in the production process that's somewhere in there then it as the responsible thing to do is to inform customers about it now vegan customers may be a little confused by it but i think for those customers that are highly allergic actually they will be looking at these labels in a lot of detail and that information that gives them more insight about the risk in terms of look this doesn't contain but it's been manufactured in in an environment that perhaps is full of the milk or egg that you're trying to avoid they can choose to make a different choice and i think for me personally having the alibi and I know that it means that you end up with some difficult reputational challenges of, well, why is that? And, and there, there is some confusion that I think we as an industry need to try and help customers to understand. But I think if your risk assessment says that there is a risk of cross-contamination, the only thing that you can do is, is tell the, the customers and consumers that their risk is there and they can make the correct informed choice. Um, so for me, I think, it's pretty clear, but I, look, that's not what how everybody sees it. And I think um, quite a lot of other um, uh, businesses perhaps don't look at alibi labeling as a potential um, solution. So I know it is contentious. My personal view would be that alibi is a sensible way to give the customer a bit more information so they can make the right choice for themselves. Just on that point, I mean, I don't know if, if you said we don't do alibi labeling, you know would it I, I imagine it's going to take a lot of products off of the market they wouldn't be on there because it wouldn't be feasible do you have any feel for that Ben yeah I do because look if we're like if you take um we're, when we're I said earlier that to make these products viable like this is a new market you can't have a like there isn't many dedicated factories we need to manufacture in in a complex environment and if we know that we're free from customers are buying into plant-based um then we know that the risk is there. And if we, we identify, if we're manufacturing in an environment which is, you know, got a lot of, it may be in an entirely different area, but you might have something like egg powder quite prevalent in the factory. And you know that it goes into the atmosphere and will travel somewhat in the factory. Now you'll minimize that to an absolute minimum risk. And in 99.99 times, you'll be able to demonstrate completely egg free. But there may be the very rare solution where you'll, you'll, you will have the opportunity for that one very small bit to contaminate. And I think if you have that, you, you then have a choice about whether you list the product or don't. And I think um, for me, for me, giving the customer that information is helpful, um, particularly for the allergic consumers who will use that information perhaps more so than some of the vegan customers. Mm. So it's but, keeping a lot of products on the market. It's making it practical as these businesses start up from quite small bases. Yeah. For me, Peter, yeah. Have you got any yeah, comments? Think, or, I'm sure you have, or things to share on this kind so of for, contentious from area. Aller, yeah, from the allergen point of view, I mean, as many uh, people on the call will know, I've been involved in allergens for, for many, many years, and we've had the similar wrestling going on with, with things like gluten, for example. You know, we have a regulated level of gluten of, of 20 ppm. Um, however, if you test your product um, and to ensure that you're there and, and actually you're, you're 10 ppm or 8 ppm, then morally you should be labeling that product as may contain gluten. And we do have, or did in these the very early days, of, of products labeled as may contain gluten on the back and gluten free on the front because it was less than 20, but there was a risk of potentially some being there. Putting my old, and again, not a legal expert, um, not been in that field for, for a while, but putting my old EHO hat on, um, I would look at a product and go, okay, is there a definable risk? And I think the very term alibi labeling isn't actually helpful. I know it's one we all use as a shortcut for the real term, um, but it sort of has, to me, slightly negative connotations. It's a case of looking at the, the process exactly as Ben has described. 
is there a real and viable risk of cross contact? Okay, egg powder, milk powder. You know, we all know the form of the allergen makes it very difficult to, or more difficult to control. You know, solid at milk, you know, in terms of a butter, will stay where you put it. Uh, so, you know, liquid milk will flow off a bit. Milk powder, you've got it all over the place. You know, you've only got to walk into any spice room in any factory and, and you can immediately smell the concoction. So you've got to look at that risk of um, potential cross contact and then warn the consumers accordingly, because that's what we're talking about here. You know, as, as Ben's alluded to, and I know one of the questions on the, on the, the q and I spotted, reference the, the, the Pret incident this week. Now, I haven't got the, don't know the full details yet. I'm still playing catch up. However, you know, you know consumers can be at disinvent, you know, poorly affected if they aren't aware so we have that that um, obligation to ensure that, that we control as much as we can and if we do think there is a clear and present danger we do make that 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 warning um clearly yeah. i agree it can be confusing for vegan products to go well it says may contain is it or isn't it Frankly, that's not for, for this team to talk about. You know, the only place you can really go to get that definitive answer currently in the absence of a legal environment is, is the Vegan Society. Okay. You know, and their, um, their, their guidelines talk very clearly about all best efforts to exclude, oh. Oh. which is fine for vegans mm -hmm. and for vegetarians. However, that may not be as, as fine for the hypoallergenic consumer. And that's, I think, where we need to, to make that distinction between ensuring that the that, that allergenic reactive consumers are able to have the information. That's what they want. They want to pick up a product and go, can I, can't I? Well, that may contain, okay, I might, I, I might stick clear of that one, but go for this one. Could be the same process, just a different decision process has gone through uh, the, the, the uh, producer's mind or the retailer's mind to get to the end labeling result. But I think as long as it's it's done um, diligently and and fully, then we do need we will have a situation for quite some time where the may contain is is still widely used. If you think of where may contain was used back in two thousand and four two thousand and five, you could barely pick up anything without saying may contain. Oh. I remember picking up a little sachet of, of tomato ketchup and it said may contain and then listed all the allergens. I'm thinking, oh. what the hell is the factory doing? Yeah. Now, no, I think I mean that, that you know that's very true. Um, I'm aware of the time. I'm just going to mm. fit in one more question because there's some interesting questions on here, but I'm just going to fit in one because you kind of touched on it as well. You mentioned the prep case, and obviously it's quite topical with the coroner's uh finding, which has come out. Um mm. and so linked with that, um, and I said I mean perhaps sort of start with Ben, because I'm interested in your view on sort of positive release out into the market and testing protocols on these kind of plant-based foods. But the question that we got is sort of links with the PRET case and asks, do you think that we're going to get compulsory uh, testing uh, coming in um, when making claims on dairy and allergen-free products? So perhaps you could start with Ben um, yeah. on that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Well. Um in terms of what they're going to bring in, I think that's, um, I guess, speculation. But I guess what I can probably say on testing is that, that, as I said in the presentation, if you get a product test, what you know is that they're, say it comes back negative, you know that, that basically that product that you tested, that one product is not contaminated with an allergen to the level of the test that you've used. That's all you know. Now, it's a really useful um, piece of information. And I would say from a plant-based perspective, it would be very sensible to positively release your plant-based products to retailers for a period of time uh, to a frequency until you can get confidence in your process, particularly if it's a new process. Um, but as I say, the limitation of positive releases, you're literally only testing that one product. And if there is contamination that is sporadic, you might not pick it up. Um, but um, I think having, having that in place would be beneficial. And certainly if you're brand new into... Um, brand new into supplying these types of products it would be sensible for a testing plan um, to have in terms of whether you should do it for every batch of every product that's um, produced uh, 
I think you might get into testing overload, if I'm honest, in terms of all of that testing. And some products should have no risk and you know will not require will be made in a dedicated facility with very simple ingredients that have no risk of cross contamination and there is you know i guess testing for for those types of products may be less relevant so i understand where it's going i suspect there might be some more push to um look at testing as a solution to um give more information but i think there is limitations to it from a from a positive release perspective so i don't think it answers everything mm. ultimately you need to do a really great validation exercise and manage all of those things i mentioned about raw materials processes etc really well and then you you know the test is just to say and that proves yeah all of those things yeah. that i've done no really the test should be proportionate to the to the risk basically yeah, that's me. right so what yeah. i'm going to do now unfortunately i'm sure we could discuss this topic mm -hmm. for an rest of the day quite easily um, and I would have lots of questions myself I'd love to ask too um, but we need to bring it to a close um, so thank you so much Ben and Peter for the very very informative presentations I often think that the challenge of getting a lot of information and having it clear and understandable which you've managed to do in a short time frame is much more difficult than having a longer time slot so thank you so much if we didn't happen to answer your questions and there are a few on there which we haven't managed to cover we have you can see on the screen the details of ben and peter they're quite happy that you approach them and you ask them questions and uh, we're very fortunate to have such experienced people um, who are so knowledgeable in this area so do make use of that there's also recording of the webinar which will be shared so you can go back and dig into it and look at it again at a later date, along with the other library of IFST webinars. And what we would ask is that you fill in the Q&A before you sign off. What we're looking to do is um, have webinars that are interesting and they're topical for people and members and non-members. So please do that and give us feedback so we can improve our future webinars. So again, thank you so much, Ben and Peter. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining and the questions that you've submitted. Thank you. Goodbye.